hey everyone. I'm Matt Graber. I'm going to be talking about Device Guard. Has anyone used or experimented with Device Guard? Okay, that's a good amount. Is anyone using it in production? We got one. Awesome. You're a brave man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, so let's cover some assumptions first. You are compromised. Deal with it. All right, so whether or not you think your company or organization is important enough or has the critical assets that a targeted actor might go after, um, you know, that, that could be debated. It ultimately doesn't matter because attackers are always going to come in these two flavors. Targeted attackers, the ones that are generally more heavily resourced and will spend whatever they whatever resources they need to spend on acquiring your critical assets to achieve whatever their objective may be. And then there's the opportunistic ones, right? So you have users who can receive emails and might be able to receive some attachments. Uh, you know, your, your outlook policies and uh, security controls may be such that uh, you know, any potentially dangerous attachments or links are going to be blocked at, uh, at, at, uh, at the gateway, right? Well, what if you still allow someone to, to browse to their Gmail and download attachments from there, right? So the opportunistic threat is always going to be out there. Actually, I want to show you this one article. If you guys haven't seen this, you should check it out. It came out last night. Um, some members of my team actually discovered this, uh, this supply chain compromise in this one popular third-party software utility where they had compromised the, the back-end infrastructure and it compromised the, uh, the update mechanism of this legitimate signed tool. And so when you would update the tool, uh, it, would, uh, it would pull down a malicious version of the same, of the same tool. Uh, now, this happened to be unsigned, and so, um, again, I, I really recommend you read this. It's really cool. So, actually, the, the team that I'm on, the uh, Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection team, we detected this internally to Microsoft because we, we deploy ATP uh, corporate-wide, and we noticed that there was a malicious PowerShell action that had occurred. Now, we didn't necessarily catch the original act as it had occurred. You know, like patient zero downloading this unsigned utility that didn't have any reputation. But this is just a really cool example of how uh, one event that occurred later in the, um, in the attack chain allowed us to go back in time, investigate, hunt throughout uh, the corporate environment and make the determination that, oh crap, like the source of this was this infected uh, update utility. So it was really cool because uh, some members of our team, uh, they contacted the vendor, the vendor got back to us, uh, gave us some information about the compromise, and then we were able to determine all the, all the companies that were affected by it, and we reported all this um, to them. So um, another point that I wanted to make here was that uh, with a whitelisting solution like Device Guard, this would have never even happened in the first place. The malicious update utility was not signed, and so because we're talking about whitelisting, where we're talking about explicit trust, deny all, unless it's something that's explicitly allowed for policy, then this malicious um, executable would not have executed in the first place. Okay. So yeah, your organization is going to have a combination thereof, either targeted or opportunistic or, or a combination. Okay. All right, so why should we care? So um, what I say is that uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of great security products out there, some of which uh, whose marketing is a little more uh, optimistic than, than others, I would say, <laughs> ones that make <laughs> Claims, I, I have actually seen claims that from certain products that they stop 100% of malware. All right. Yeah, that one. It's bullshit. <laughs> All right, that's never going to happen. Uh, 
you know, I, I'm very confident in the ability of device guard to block the majority of threats out there, but I make no claims that it will stop 100% of a malware out there. Large percentage, yes, but for example, anything that's going to target device guards specifically, and there are bypasses and we can mitigate against most of those. Uh, if you're not prepared to mitigate against those bypasses, then again, we're not talking about 100% of malware being prevented, all right? Now, we're here at a PowerShell conference. Who here has been asked by someone who's freaking out about security and all the PowerShell malware out there? Who's been asked, how do I block PowerShell? Okay, it's about the majority of the room here. Yeah, I've been asked that as well plenty of times, especially considering I've, I've written a large uh, portion of the malware out there. <laughs> all right, so yeah, I, I'm tired of being asked how to block PowerShell malware. So. What I feel is the proper answer to this is utilize the security controls that PowerShell, specifically version five, offers you. And to uninstall PowerShell version two. Because all of the protections that you get with device guard and device guard um, enforces constrained language mode in PowerShell, if an attacker can just re-enable or use PowerShell version two, none of this applies, okay? That's extremely important. All right, so why do we ultimately fail at security? And I think the answer, well, the oversimplistic answer to this is the following, implicit trust, okay? We basically trust everything, and then we put security products in place where we're kind of just rolling the dice as to whether or not it's going to catch it. So, you know, everyone likes to make fun of antivirus, as you know, it's kind of a joke, it's trivial to, to bypass. And that's largely true to an extent. Now, antivirus is, is great, and I would never recommend that someone not have an antivirus solution in place. But, uh, I mean, if a determined actor wants to bypass signatures, like, it's pretty trivial, right? So if that's like one of the only security controls that you're relying upon, then you really are just rolling the dice and you're leaving uh, the security of your organization to luck, especially if you're not um, if you're not reviewing logs and you don't have other like detective controls in place. Again, we're not ever going to stop 100% of the threats on our network. We can do a good job, and Device Guard um, will do do a really good job at preventing a large quantity of these, but it's never going to catch anything or everything. Sorry. So what should we do? Should we panic? Well, we've seen this before, right? Well, oh God, there's PowerShell malware everywhere. How do I block PowerShell? Should we deny that this is uh, that there's even a problem? Oh, my my organization would never be targeted by an APT actor. It would never happen. So you see, we're we're start we're going through the stages of grief here until we get to the end, where we need to just accept that attackers will be in our organization at one point or another, or they probably already are, which is why we should take on this assume breach mentality, implement preventive controls as best as you can. So thanks for attending my talk, because that's what I'm talking about. Um, but also ensure that you have those detective controls as well. And I gave one example of where uh, Windows Defender ATP uh, came to the rescue within Microsoft um, so, because again, yeah, we're not going to catch everything, okay? And what I think is that we should start by trusting nothing unless explicitly stated otherwise. And that's what Device Guard allows us to do. Here's some, some of the basic tenets of application whitelisting. And I lump them broadly into two categories. These, there's the, I, the idealistic tenets of white, whitelisting, which is what I just stated. Trust nothing unless explicitly stated otherwise. And in order to properly achieve that, in my opinion, there needs to be a human involved in every decision. So you want to enable Chrome in your enterprise, right? So ideally, a human would be behind that decision and look at Chrome.exe, look at all the modules it loads, identify that it is all signed by the same code signing certificate, and then give the thumbs up or thumbs down that you, you're reasonably confident 
that this actually came from Google and is a trusted application. So add that rule to your policy and move on. I think what happens more often in reality is when whitelisting is considered, what it's used for is I need to exit, like people need to execute stuff, so I'm just going to allow that and then have, and then otherwise let, allow the whitelisting solution to get out of the way. And so I, a good practice is to kind of strike a balance between both because there are some pitfalls, in my opinion, on the realistic method to tackling whitelisting. Or sorry, the, not the idealistic, the, what, what happens in reality, which is I need to execute something like just, just allow it for me, please, and get out of my way. Okay, so another, um, all right, so whitelisting is all about trust, okay? And trust will mean different things to different people, um, but ultimately I think it falls, well, so, so here's sort of like the, ideal, the idealistic definition, in my opinion, of trust, which is, um, you know, application of a strict process to determine trust, i.e. Uh, a human is behind that decision, right? So the pitfall to that is that it's pretty expensive. Like there has to be a human for the decision to be made for every single application to either run or not run. And it requires expertise to properly apply trust to an executable or a script. Uh, in reality, um, again, uh, you simply want to identify what's necessary to conduct business and then just go ahead and allow it. The potential pitfall there is that there could be some unintended consequences where um, you, there's sort of like some implicit trust involved there because you, there wasn't someone with like that security expertise to really make the decision other than our client needs to use this program, just go ahead and allow it. There could be some unintended consequence, consequences. And I'll discuss uh, some, ex uh, some specific examples in a little bit. Okay, so benefits of app whitelisting, block everything that is not specifically tailored to, uh, to bypass the whitelisting solution. Okay, the reason I have a, an asterisk there is because, well, whitelisting is not going to protect you against exploits, right? So if you ex exploit a vulnerability in an application, you gain arbitrary code execution. So you have code execution in the context of one of these trusted applications, right? Now, uh, with something like Device Guard, uh, you can further caveat this as you actually get a whole host of additional uh, kernel exploit mitigations with Device Guard if your hardware can support it using some uh, hypervisor-based uh, features. And um, I gave a talk with Casey Smith recently at Troopers uh, in, in Heidelberg uh, about a month ago, and we were talking about Device Guard, and a uh, great thing that Casey came up with was uh, we're trying to come up with names of how to classify uh, actors broadly, and what he came up with is uh, there's a naive class of attacker. So attackers that, whether they're targeted or opportunistic, are not necessarily aware of all the security controls in your environment, nor do they necessarily have the resources or the means to bypass them. And then there's the enlightened attackers. And these, these could be, again, either targeted or opportunistic attackers that are very aware of how to bypass security controls. I think a good example of an enlightened attacker is, uh, has anyone followed like the shadow brokers dump? Like the supposed like NSA tool set that, that was leaked recently. So like th there was some tooling in there that was very specific to uh, like bypasses around like antivirus programs, right? So um, that class of attacker is very mindful of things like device guard and is aware of how to bypass those. So um, one of the amazing benefits of whitelisting is that right out of the box, assuming you have a relatively strong policy, you eliminate the naive class of attackers because they don't have any specific means of bypassing your policy. You would have to know what that policy is in the first place and have means of bypassing it in order to get around it. So, and the reason I bring this up is uh, while there may be some like trivial bypasses, and I'll cover some of these to device guard, 
um, people tend to completely disregard uh, security technology because there's a relatively easy bypass. Well, um, so let, let's talk about like PowerShell malware now. Um, you know, like Will and myself, we've come up with like all these techniques to be like extremely stealthy, uh, avoid command line logging. So we, we really go out of our way to avoid um, uh, defenders uh, who are actively looking at PowerShell. Well, the reality is, in, in a previous job, I was a malware reverse engineer, and we, we saw a massive influx of PowerShell malware. <laughs> the only thing is, I would say about 90% of the PowerShell malware started with that simple um, uh, net.webclient like, download cradle, which then passed the string, which is usually like invoke shellcode or invoke mimikatz, to invoke expression, right? So like, the majority of the actors out there, like yes, they're using PowerShell, but they're still not at a high enough sophistication to uh, fall into that enlightened category. And so something like Device Guard would prevent that in, from occurring in the first place. So Microsoft's latest solution to application whitelisting is called Device Guard. Um, so many of you are probably already familiar with AppLocker. AppLocker is a pretty great technology. It's been around, around for a while. One of the things that I like about AppLocker is that you can apply rules to groups and users. Device Guard, it's the code integrity policy that you create uh, is device-wide. Um, but one of the main benefits of Device Guard is that it's extremely resilient to tampering. Whereas if you run as an admin on a system running, uh, enforcing AppLocker, then you can just disable AppLocker easily. Uh, there are some protections built into Device Guard that even a rogue admin would not be able to easily disable Device Guard. Uh, it's core OS component now, so there's a couple ways to enable it. But once you build a binary uh, code integrity policy, basically drop it into a folder and then you're good to go. There's some additional um, configurations that you can do to prevent overwrites of that policy. Um, I'll get into those if I have time a little bit later. But what Device Guard does is it enforces uh, your whitelisting policy on both binaries and scripts. So what do I mean by binaries? We're talking about exes, DLLs, uh, device drivers, MSIs, um, and really, it, well, any like portable executable file. So even like CPLs, like control panel files, um, it, there's a lot more like PE file extensions that are escaping me that this will also cover. And then scripts, so PowerShell, and also any Windows script host language, so uh, JScript or VBScript are covered by this. Um, and real quickly, the enforcement mechanism for uh, VBScript and JScript is uh, if a script is not conformant to policy, you can still execute um, language features of VB script or JScript, but you can't instantiate any COM objects. And it's really COM that makes VB scripts and JScript useful if you even consider those languages to be useful at all these days. Um, and as I said before, uh, if your hardware supports it, you actually gain a whole host of additional uh, kernel exploit mitigations. And the great thing about Device Guard is that it's supported on all modern SKUs of Windows. So we're talking about Windows 10. No, well, if you read the documentation for Device Guard, it would say that it's only supported on Windows 10 Enterprise. It's actually not true. You can, conf you can only configure policies on Windows 10 Enterprise using the config CI module that I'll show briefly. But you can actually deploy a binary CI policy to any Windows 10 SKU. So Windows 10 Pro, Enterprise, Server 2016, uh, full desktop, server core, and even nano server, which is really cool. You're never gonna find any other, uh, you're never gonna find a third party uh, whitelisting solution or likely uh, antivirus solution on, on nano server. So uh, you are covered on that platform. All right, so device card. Um, it's all configurable using the config CI module, again, can only be configured in Windows 10 Enterprise. Um, that wasn't my decision. Uh, if, if you don't like it, then maybe enough voices would convince the, 
the Vice Guard team to allow you to configure policies on, on other systems. But that's what you got, so it's what you got to deal with. All right, so um, the most common commandlets that you would use to configure policy are the following. New CI policy just creates a new policy based on some of the arguments that you pass to it. And when I refer to a policy, I'm referring to an XML document, which is then converted to a binary policy using convert from CI policy. And I have a demo. Um, I'll go through all this briefly to give some context around this. Um, in addition to creating the rules for your policy, so like what, what signers and what hashes are allowed, uh, there's also the set rule option commandlet, which specifies how device guard will be configured once the policy is deployed. And then as you need to create new rules for your policy, uh, there's various other ways to do that, but once you have a new policy, you can merge it with like a base master policy using merge CI policy. Now the enforcement mechanism for uh, PowerShell in Device Guard, as is also the case with AppLocker with PowerShell v5, is constrained language mode. Um, does anyone want me to dig into this? I, I um, I went into some pretty good detail in my last talk. Is anyone here not really that familiar with constrained language mode? Okay, we, we got someone. Okay, a few people. Okay, so what constrained language mode does is it allows you to execute any commandlets. Um, so, okay, if you're executing something that is not approved per policy, um, then you cannot call... Um, .NET uh, methods, uh, instance methods or static methods. Uh, you can't call .NET object uh, uh, setters. So like you can't assign something to a property for a .NET class unless that .NET class is whitelisted. And there's about 30 whitelisted classes, but there's, there's a lot more classes in the .NET uh, library um, that will not be available to you directly. So like you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to call a new, uh, new object on something, nor would you be able to call methods on it after instantiating it. Um, but you can execute any function or commandlet that is signed per policy with one exception, uh, add type. So add type would allow us to bypass um, uh, user mode code integrity in device guard because it takes arbitrary C sharp, compiles it, loads it into your uh, run space and, and executes it. So obviously we, that is not something that's desirable to someone running in constrained language mode because then we would not be able to make the guarantee of having, um, well, we want the, the aim of constrained language mode is to prevent arbitrary unsigned code execution. We only want to run signed code uh, approved per policy. Now, all of this is pointless if PowerShell version two is installed. So please, again, make sure that you uh, disable this and monitor for re, uh, an attacker potentially re-enabling it because PowerShell version two is just an optional Windows feature that can simply be re-enabled. Okay, uh, let me just show you a quick example here. So to see what run space I'm in, I can do host.runspace.language mode. And now language mode is a property of this run space object and a property in .NET is a special kind of method. It's a getter method. In constrained language mode, you can, uh, you can access properties. So you can execute get, getter properties of .NET methods. So that's, that's why I'm allowed to do this here. But I can't do things like call new object on one of the non-whitelisted um, .NET classes for example, I, I usually use an int pointer as an example of what I'm not allowed to instantiate. So it says only core types are supported in, the, in this language mode. And you do help about um, language modes. You can do that yourself. And uh, there's, <laughs> there's really good documentation on all the language modes. Um, the most documentation revolves around constrained language mode and, and telling you what you can and cannot do. So here's like another method that I would not be able to 
execute the static add method. It won't allow it. But one of the classes that I can instantiate and call methods on is the strings. Okay. Uh, to upper. So I can call all these methods and when I was researching device guard, I was interested in, okay, what is what is a whitelist of the allowed, the, or the, the core types that are allowed in constrained language mode? And I went through each individual one looking to see if there's any potential bypass opportunities. Um, in my first go through, I, I didn't find any. So, I mean, the PowerShell team did a, did a pretty good job of uh, determining which, uh, which classes um, are valuable to have, yet, not susceptible to uh, to bypasses. You, you feel free to, to go through a second run and report any of your findings to uh, to secure at Microsoft.com. All right. <laughs> okay, so um, I've mentioned using mode code integrity uh, before. So. Um, Device Guard is split into kernel mode code integrity and user mode code integrity. So you can have separate rules for device drivers versus user mode code. And any bypass to constrain language mode should be considered a user mode code integrity bypass. Because as we know, uh, there's nothing that you can't do in PowerShell and using .NET to access like lower level APIs. Like there's nothing you can't do in PowerShell that you can't do in C++, right? assuming you don't have the restrictions of constrained language mode, which is what con constrained language mode aims to prevent. Okay, so how do you go about generating these policies in the first place? There's a couple methodologies out there. The one that I see recommended the most often is to take a base golden image and simply scan all the binaries and scripts and device drivers on there and bake those into your base policy. So the pro to that is that it's easy. It may take a little bit over an hour or so to scan every, every binary and then just implicitly trust it. Remember I said, well, I'm not a fan of implicit trust because you tend to be rolling the dice. And so what if, for example, and Will mentioned this in his talk, what if that gold base image is backdoored? Or what if there's a signed binary, say signed by Microsoft or some other trusted third party that would unintentionally allow arbitrary code execution? And there's actually a lot of examples of this that I'll cover briefly. Um, and then there's the default deny all approach. This is what I recommend. It takes a lot more work. So what I do is um, when I create my policy, I'll place it into audit mode and have zero rules in it, meaning deny all device drivers from loading, deny all, deny all user mode code from executing. And it's obviously important that it be in audit mode, otherwise your system's not going to boot. And then, so let it run in audit mode, and then from uh, using these commandlets, you can collect everything that would have been blocked from the event log, and then incorporate that into your policy. And then iterate over that over time. So th this is a time consuming process, but it aims to apply the concept of explicit trust, right? So obviously we need to allow all the device drivers and user mode files um, necessary to, to boot and run the operating system. So generally we're, we're gonna want to allow any, pretty much anything signed by Microsoft, right? And then whatever additional third-party applications you, you'd want to, uh, to allow. I'm sorry, what's the question? Yeah, using, so the question was, would this mean that you would not be able to necessarily run arbitrary signed code? And yes, that's true to an extent. Um, for example, silly example, like if you determine that kernel 32 needed to uh, be trusted, which of course it would, but uh, some other arbitrary DLL that's exceedingly rare is signed by Microsoft, 
just never actually in, in reality is ever loaded into a process, then that, depending on the rules that you set, that could not be allowed to, to be loaded into a process. I'm sorry? Mm, no, I'm not, not, not necessarily, yeah. Uh, th this will become more clear uh, in a little bit once I start diving into demos. Okay. Now, when you're generating these policies, the um, what is ideal is that the installer application and all the modules or like DLLs required for that application are all signed using the same signing certificate. A uh, good example of a company that implements proper signing procedures besides Microsoft, which is generally good, uh, is, is Google. So I was uh, pleasantly surprised, and this will be in my demo, that everything signed by Google, because I, I wanted to whitelist Chrome for my device card system, everything was signed using the same signing certificate. So that was great, because I only needed to create a single rule in my code integrity policy to allow anything signed by Google, and it worked great. The worst case is, maybe some things will be signed and others won't be signed, Unfortunately, this is like usually more often the case. So let's say nothing is signed. In this case, uh, you would need your own code signing cert and either create, um, well, you could either create a list of hashes for what you want to approve and put those into your policy or create a catalog file and then sign that catalog file. So a catalog file, does anyone know what a catalog file is? Anyone? You want to give it a shot? No, but behind you, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's basically just a file containing a list of hashes, um, which you can then sign. So, and and then you would have your code signing certificate as an approved signer in your policy. So this is this this is definitely a pain. Does anyone know the the issue with Approving by, by hash? Updating, yeah, exactly. As soon as there's any change to the binary, you have to go through this whole process again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so um, what you're referring to is one of the, like, the, the newer features in Device Guard called um, Managed Installer, I think it's called. So where you can integrate SCCM with Device Guard. It actually requires an app locker rule to allow this for some reason. I haven't really dug into all the details yet, but yes, that is a mechanism that will like constantly like reapply the new hash rules to abstract that away. And so um, earlier on when I said like, uh, the ideal whitelisting solution is a balance between like applying explicit trust and also well like manageability. And so what, what you refer to is like the integration with SCCM. Like it definitely increases the manageability, but perhaps it might come at a cost of like just implicitly allowing those things that need to run in your enterprise. All right, so let me let me dive into some demos here. But first, let me show you the policy that I have deployed on the system that I'm presenting from. So don't think that everything will break just because you're running device guard. That's not the case. Okay, so there's a few things, uh, a few things we'll see here. In the rules section of this uh, XML code integrity policy are all the configuration options of device guard after I convert this into binary form and deploy it. So I'm enforcing store applications, so my code integrity policy, the user mode rules will also apply to store applications. Uh, I'm enabling UMCI. So if this was not present, then code integrity would only apply to device drivers. And while it can be a challenge to deploy these rules, um, I recommend that you start off with um, with kernel uh, with uh, with device driver rules, because device drivers generally are not going to be in flux too often. 
right? So you're not going to have to like constantly be uh, adding new device drivers. So th this is like, you know, th this is a way that you could take baby steps into getting to user mode code integrity. Because everything in user mode is constantly in flux. And so you're going to have to be more on top of updating your rules as things are updated or you just need to install new software. Um, this refers to, um, I, I personally require that all of my drivers be Windows Hardware Quality Labs signed. Um, this is actually a requirement uh, starting in RS2. Any new drivers have to be co-signed uh, using uh, with the Windows Hardware Quality Lab certification requirements. Um, advanced boot options, don't need to get into that. And right now, um, I am not enforcing the signing of my policy. You can sign your policy using, you can specify a, it's down here in, uh, here in update policy signers. So this ID refers to a specific signer, which let me search for it. So we'll backtrack a little bit and I can show you what the signer is. This is my personal code signing certificate is approved to sign and update code integrity policies. And the cert root value here of type TBS, TBS means to be signed, is basically a hash of the certificate. And this is the most secure way to refer to a code signing certificate is by its hash versus by its name. So, you know, um, if it just went by name, then anyone could go out and get a code signing cert with the name Matthew Graber and, uh, and they would just run rampant. So I'm not enforcing um, the signing of the code integrity policy, but it's a very good thing to do because it actually, um, if you have TPM enabled, uh, when you sign your policy, even if you delete the binary policy from system32 uh, code integrity, sipolicy.p7b, it doesn't actually go away. It'll be restored from a secure UEFI variable upon reboot as if nothing ever happened. Now, I also have some block rules in here. Um, and so remember what I said about um, like implicit trust and how like if you're a little too, too broad in your rules, there could be unintended consequences. Well, I find it to be very reasonable to just blanket allow anything signed by Microsoft because one, you need your operating system to boot, to run, and to update itself, correct? But there are some unintended consequences with that. Uh, and here's a few of them right here. MS Build, is anyone familiar with MS Build? Yeah, we got some developers here, okay. So MS Build, uh, Casey Smith, uh, sub T on Twitter, uh, really popularize this attack. What you can do in MS Build is specify an inline task. It's just an XML file that can have embedded C Sharp in it. So when you run MS Build on that, it's a built-in device guard bypass. And it's a utility signed by Microsoft, which you're going to be uh, whitelisting, of course. And so uh, what you need to do is you kind of, as a defender, you kind of need to be on top of what all these bypass techniques are which is kind of a pain, but it's a necessary evil. And so uh, I, I maintain a GitHub repository consisting of a device card policy of just block rules for signed Microsoft code that you can just merge into your base policy. And I update that as new techniques come out. So I have like CDB, uh, I don't know why WinBag is not in there. So CDB, uh, WinDBG, these are debuggers, right? And debuggers, allow you to attach to a process, edit memory, edit, uh, redirect the instruction pointer to wherever you want. So these are unintentional uh, device card bypasses as well. So they should be blocked accordingly. MS build, CSI, DNX, these are like, um, like C-sharp, uh, like interpreters, various other debuggers. So we need to explicitly block these. Question. Yeah, so it's really difficult to uh, implement whitelisting on developer systems, yeah? So, I mean, this is where you'd want to likely, um, you know, segment those systems or implement a procedure 
where uh, anything created internally is first signed with like a, a test signing certificate, which could be added to the policy for just developers. Yep. <laughs> it, if, you, if you need MS, well, remember I said, like, we're not going to stop 100% of threats. So uh, if people need to run MS build, then you also need the ability to audit whenever MS build is executed. Yeah, in those situations, isolate them as much as you possibly can. I mean, sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll need internet access, but yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, let's go through and start building out some policies. So I want to whitelist chrome.exe. And uh, I have two examples here, the ideal case and the less than ideal case, and we'll, we'll cover both. Okay, so... Um, in theory, what I would be doing here is I would be generating this rule on another system that, um, because, well, if I haven't allowed Chrome to install in the first place, then it won't install on, on this system. So um, look, me having Chrome here in this path assumes I was able to install it in the first place. So let's just assume that we're on some other system that's not device guard protected. So... I would go to the path, and then we're going to create a temp directory that um, we're going to copy chrome.exe to and create a code integrity policy based on the signer of chrome.exe. Okay, so what I'm doing here now is I'm calling get system driver. It's one of the commandlets in config CI. The name is a little confusing. What it does is it gets the hash file and signer information for one or more files. In this case, I'm just doing it for one file, uh, chrome.exe. And you see a bunch of information here, like some signer hash information. A little bit of information about the, the binary. Uh, is it a user mode binary, yes or no? This is important because if, it, uh, if this is false, then the rule would be added to the kernel mode rules. Since it's true, it's added to the user mode rules. But the reason that I found this to be a little confusing is because we're talking about a user mode binary here, but this command is called get system driver. So it applies to both drivers and user mode code. Okay, so I have the relevant signer information for Chrome. And now I'm going to create a new policy based on that signer. And there's all these different like levels of rules that you can create. One of my favorites, if I'm feeling relatively generous, is Publisher. And what Publisher is, there's really good documentation online about this. Publisher refers to combination of the PCA certificate and the con common name of the LEAF certificate. So what do I mean by that? Uh, let's see. Okay, here's Chrome. We're gonna go look at the, the certificate here and go to view the certificate chain, certification path. So the PCA certificate is usually one level up. It's the issuer of the uh, code signing certificate. So a publisher rule creates a rule based on the hash of this signing certificate, this PCA, this issuing certificate and the common name of the LEAF certificate, in this case, Google Inc. And the reason I like this rule is because 
the validity period of a PCA certificate is usually in the range of like a decade. So when you're dealing with certificates that are only valid for a year, then a year later down the road, you're going to have to update your rules. The PCA certificate, that's not the case. So in this case, with the publisher rule, what we're saying is we're trusting anything, any certificate issued by Symantec that has the name Google Incorporated in it would be approved. And that's what the case is with uh, anything signed by Google, in this case, Chrome. Sure, so uh, there could, I haven't actually tested this myself, um, the attack scenario where, let's say I was able to get a code signing certificate issued by Symantec under the name Google Inc. If I were able to do that, then it would probably be in the news that Symantec like, does not have a proper vetting procedure to issue code signing certificates. If me, Joe Schmo, could just get a code signing cert issued as Google Incorporated. There would also be a collision, too, because Google Inc. has already been issued, right? So, question? I'm sorry? You could, which is why, again, I suggest using the publisher rule, because I think most of the Microsoft PCA certificates go to like 2028. Who knows what world we'll live in in 2028, but <laughs> no, you, you'll, you'll need to update your policy, whatever form that may take in 2028. Okay. Okay, so um, now I can take that Chrome signer info and create a new policy based on that. And it looks like this. It just created a single rule here, this publisher rule. So this here is the hash of the PCA certificate, so the hash of that uh, semantic issuing certificate. Uh, and it's a combination of that and the common name of the LEAF certificate, Google Incorporated. And this is applied to, um, hmm. this got applied to the wrong place somehow. I forget why. So uh, this signer rule should actually be in the Windows signing scenario, not the driver scenario. So... I could either just copy this over or figure out why this happened in the first place. So it, it's actually important that uh, if you're using this frequently that you become sort of comfortable with this XML schema as, as you work with it. Now, another thing that I can do is I can take the signer information, generate a rule for it dynamically in PowerShell, this Google, so with a new CI policy rule commandlet. And then I can merge it directly into a base policy, which is what I do here with the merge CI policy commandlet. And now this new uh, this new merge policy should have so it will ha consist of my base policy, and then Google should be somewhere in here, right here. So real easy way in the ideal scenario to merge uh, signer rules into a base policy. And again, what I mean by ideal is everything is signed using the same signing certificate which Google has been really good about. Okay, so let's talk about the, the worst case scenario. So here um, in my example, I, just, I, I have a simple module, it doesn't really do anything, it just 
implements this get foo function. Uh, actually, yeah, this is a really bad example because write host works just fine in constrained language mode. But just imagine that maybe this is called add type. And uh, yeah, I didn't mention this before. If something is signed and approved per policy, in this case, this module, uh, anything approved per policy executes in full language mode. So you don't have any of the restrictions, meaning you can call add type if that's what you need it to do. So let's go through the process of approving this PowerShell module. And this module consists of, you know, it's your typical module. Uh, here, it, it just has a module manifest and a PSM1 file. So I want to go and approve that and sign it. So the route that I'm going to take is I'm going to create a catalog file for it and sign it and deploy it. So in PowerShell version 5, you have these new file catalog commandlets. There's new file catalog and test file catalog. This is a great way to easily generate these in PowerShell. So here I'm going to specify catalog version 2, which um, I believe will not work in Windows 7 and below and server 2008 R2 and below, perhaps. I could be wrong. Um, but catalog version 2 uses a SHA-256 hash instead of the default version 1 uh, MD5 hash. And some of you may be aware that the MD5 is extremely prone to collisions. <clears throat> and then we specify the catalog file path, and then the path that we want to generate the catalog file from, so every file within this module. OK, so now we have this cat file. And previously, the only way that you could view a catalog file was visually by clicking on it, going to the security catalog, and there's all these tags in here which have hashes. I wrote a, I went through the painstaking process of uh, reverse engineering the file format of catalog files before I joined Microsoft and, um, and wrote a catalog file parser. So you can now view all this information in, in PowerShell. And to, sh to give you an idea of uh, what's stored inside catalog files is, let's go into catalog members. Uh, let's look at this first tag and it's hash info. And so here's a SHA-256 hash. And now if I do an ls on foo module, type it to get file hash algorithm, I think it defaults to SHA-256 you'd see we have a match here. So again, a catalog file is just a collection of, of hashes and some additional metadata, which you can then sign. Now, I don't have my code signing certificate on this system. That's really bad practice. Never store your code signing certs on systems that you intend to protect, because then you could just sign stuff that is already approved uh, per policy and, and bypass all the rules. Now, um, the other commandlet here is test file catalog. So this will just go over all the files that you specify and ensure that all the hashes match. And here, I'll have some slides to cover the implications of this. So what, what, what you do with this is once you've created and validated your catalog file, you would call uh, set authentic code signature on it with your and apply your approved certificate and then you would have to deploy it and all catalog files are stored in C Windows System 32 cat roots uh, F75 whatever this is where all the uh, system catalog files are and you may have noticed when I went and we visually inspected the certificate of uh, Google Chrome, we could actually see it in the file information. Sometimes you won't see that, but if you do uh, get authentic code, get authentic code signature gives you the same information that you could see visually. For something like um, Notepad, thank you. 
So it's signed, but if you were to go to the file, file properties, there would be no digital signature tab. And this confuses a lot of people initially when they deal with uh, code signing. And the reason that it's not there is because Notepad is not authentic code signed. It doesn't have an embedded signature. It has its hash somewhere in the catalog store. So that's why this comes up as valid. It goes through all the catalog files, finds the matching hash, and then looks at the signer of the catalog file. And that's how that um, signer is applied to a PE or a script that doesn't have an embedded authentic code signature. All right, so code signing best practices. OK, so all code signing does is it ensures the integrity. So the only guarantee code signing makes is that the person who signed that code um, was the one who signed it. And that if, the, it's a little redundant, right? Uh, so if, if there's any modification to it in route, there will be a hash mismatch and it will fail to validate the certificate. And so you could use uh, get authentic code signature to validate that. There's also sig check to do um, validation as well. But again, all it does is ensure integrity. And uh, you know th this mistake is commonly made if something is signed, that doesn't mean it's not malicious. You know, uh, Digicert issued me a free code signing certificate because I was a PowerShell MVP. Well, I've used it to sign PowerSploit in the past. So, like, again, all it does is it ensures the integrity of PowerSploit as it owns your, your network. All right. <laughs> all right. So... Uh, oh yeah, another thing is um, it can be difficult to revoke uh, vulnerable PowerShell code. So I showed you some of the deny rules that I had for like uh, WinDBG, MS Build. Those are actually relatively easy to block because they block by uh, file name and not the file name on disk, the original file name which is embedded in the PE header and the version number. So what I would say is um, any file with in its original file name that has windbg.exe and all versions are blocked, right? PowerShell scripts are not version aware. So if there's a signed PowerShell script that happens to be vulnerable and poses a constrained language mode bypass uh, scenario, you can only block it by hash. So it is incumbent upon you to track down all the hashes of all the known vulnerable versions because you can fix it revoke you know it, you can revoke a single hash but then if there was another version of the same vulnerable scripts in the past then an attacker can just bring that with them and leverage that to bypass constrained language mode so there's actually an effort um, being made right now in, uh, within Microsoft. So I, uh, myself and uh, some other former colleagues have found a bunch of these bypasses in, uh, in signed scripts. And so uh, we actually now have a list of all those hashes. So expect to see those published uh, in, uh, within the next week or so. So that you can take those hashes, merge those into your base policies, and then you're covered uh, from having those bypasses being brought with an attacker. Okay, so uh, catalog signing procedures, we went through this, use new file catalog, you then sign it and validate it. What's really cool is that if uh, you're publishing to the PowerShell gallery and you create that catalog file, uh, you name the catalog file the same name as your module. So in my case, it was like foo module. Within the foo module directory, you would have foo module.cat which is signed by your code signing certificate. And then when anyone calls install a module to pull it down <clears throat> from the gallery, that code is validated against that, uh, that catalog that's pulled down. So this isn't uh, really documented at this point, but now you're, now you're aware of it. And there, there are, um, I, I don't know how many are in the PowerShell gallery. I know one of them is like uh, uh, PS Script Analyzer and Pester. If you download those, you'll see that there's an included catalog file 
that it validates again. So if there was, say, like hypothetically, like a man in the middle attack where someone tried to inject PowerShell code into it in routes, it wouldn't actually install because it would fail to validate against the catalog file that was included. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, so um, he was saying that there's some issues with, it was a pester, you said? Yeah. Where, yeah, I guess some of the, where they, presumably they failed to update the catalog file for all the latest hashes, so. Hmm. Oh, okay, yeah. So then that would enable the man in the middle scenario if you skip those checks, yeah. But if you had device guard, if it was man in the middle, then it wouldn't be approved for policy and it wouldn't execute. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I just talked about this. So um, Casey Smith, he, re he refers to those binaries that you implicitly allow. So like we need to allow Microsoft sign code to run, uh, but things like MS build, uh, he refers to as misplaced trust binaries, which require explicit blacklist rules. And again, yeah, bypassing or blacklisting bypass scripts can be hard because you have to go and collect all those hashes and block them by hash. Any questions in the back? The question is how much work is involved in updating policy after like a Windows update occurs and yeah. Nine times out of 10, there won't be any additions that you need to make to your policy, assuming that you've just blanket allowed Microsoft signers. Uh, recall I said that uh, moving forward, um, all drivers need to be WICWL signed, the Windows Hardware Quality Lab signed, meaning they're, co they're co signed by Microsoft. So they're going to have that, um, that code signing signature uh, certificate applied to it, which you've presumably already whitelisted. Otherwise, your system wouldn't have booted. It's not relying upon TPM and UEFI, but you get significant benefits from having TPM enabled. Yeah, so um, if your hypervisor solution allows for uh, like secure boot and TPM, then you're that much better covered against uh, device guard being tampered with, um, but you don't technically need uh, TPM. Like it, it, if, you're, if you're using VMware, for example, and you just want to experiment with device guard, all you do is you take your uh, XML policy, convert it to binary form with convert from P, uh, CI policy, copy it to see Windows System 32, code integrity, sipolicy.p7b. This is all thoroughly documented in MSDN, by the way. And then once you do that and you reboot, then that policy will be applied to your system. Now it's extremely prone to being tampered with by a rogue admin because all they would need to do is delete that policy. But it's, it's perfectly suitable for experimentation, but it's not properly hardened at that point. Are there any examples that you could think of of what has changed in the last three months? I'm drawing a blank. 
Mm, no, that's that's not necessary. Oh, like there's documentation stating that you need. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, if you want to get with me later and point that out, um, if there's a discrepancy in documentation, I I can get that taken care of. Sir. If it's a new certificate that's not approved for policy, Chrome will stop working. Yes, there's a code integrity event log that would indicate that. Oops. Am I being kicked out? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll take any follow on questions outside. So thank you.